So good afternoon again, everybody. My name is AJ Ehrenstein. I'm one of the two deans of Beyond Barnard. Today is day four of STEM Careers Week as part of Summer Colloquium, which is an integrated series of about 75 events across the summer meant to keep you all connected virtually to the Barnard community, learning professional skills, hearing from alumni and faculty, and doing lots of really fun stuff across a lot of different fields. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, it is a beautiful sunny day outside my window today in Brooklyn for the first time in three days, so excited about that. Um, but I want to say hello and welcome first and foremost to our uh, three, four fabulous alumni who are joining us. Um, and I don't want to take up really any airtime, but instead uh, basically hand it off to them to kind of maybe do an opening round. This is a week dedicated to STEM careers. Uh, the four of you represent a pretty wide range of academic fields. You represent a pretty wide range of, of career directions of current jobs. And we'd love to just hear to get it started, you know, um, who are you? What are you up to? Um, and maybe some thoughts about how, just to, to start, up, start things off, how a, a training in a Barnard STEM field has prepared you for the career that you find yourself currently in. And I'll go on mute and I'll let you guys just kind of knock it around. Sure. I can kick it off. <laughs> um, so I'm Carson Kraft. Um, I'm currently a digital product manager um, for an e-commerce company called Wellco, um, which is a wellness startup that was founded by Elle McPherson five years ago. Um, as a digital product manager, I kind of do an half and half um, marketing strategy, content strategy for digital, um, half more technical work um, like web development. Um, I take on back end projects um, as they're needed. Um, and I was very well prepared by Barnard um, for going into this career. I think above, so I studied computer science um, and I also studied French um, and I was definitely encouraged to have at Barnard this like very overall liberal, liberal arts education where I could balance both my technical interests um, and my more creative interests as well. Um, and so I took a lot of art history classes. Um, I took advanced programming and linear algebra alongside my like French literature classes. Um, and overall it really put me in a great position to um, think critically um, and also gain those technical skills that I needed to um, be able to do web development or understand Java. Um, and the other thing that was just really helpful about Barnard specifically was um, people love to have Barnard interns. And I really jumpstarted my career um, working at Chanel as a digital intern there. Um, I did e-commerce project management. Um, and the way that I got that was because I had that great balance of interests in computer science and French. Um, and it was a very like niche job um, because I had to have that background of understanding French culture, understanding French aesthetics, but then also having the um, digital skills and the technical skills um, in order to succeed there. Um, and just from there, I mean, I've been building on my career and that's when I finally got this full-time job. So overall, I've, Barnard set me up very well for my current role. Hi, I'm Joanne Lee. I'm class of 2019 and I majored in cell and molecular biology. And currently I work as a research technician at Wellcome Now Medicine. And so at Barnard, I did I spent a lot of time doing research and I felt like that really prepared me for my current role because it kind of gave me the skills to now be able to execute my own experiments, do my own analysis, and now be kind of leading this project. I think at Barnard they do a good job <clears throat> at you know giving you the foundations and then giving you autonomy to then carry on projects and research and I really I, I saw the value in that and I really valued that when I was an undergrad and now I get to practice that every day. And 
um, yeah, I, I, uh, along with my research experiences, the courses at Barnard carry over similar um, teaching doctrine in which like you're given a lot of the, the biology labs, you start out with foundational experiments and such, and then usually towards the end, you're given the opportunity to like, make your own project or make your own experiment. So I felt like that really prepared me for my current role. Awesome. Um, hi, I guess I can go next. Hi everyone, my name is Shay. Um, I'm class of 2018. I was an environmental policy major back at Barnard um, and I minored in statistics. Um, currently now I am a data analyst for an advertising technology company where we facilitate the buying and selling of ads online. Um, and I really love that, the work that I do now. Um, I feel like Barnard definitely you know, as mentioned earlier by the other panelists, Barnard definitely did prepare me for this. Um, but I think something that I really loved about my like educational training at Barnard was just kind of like how holistic um, my experience was. It was both technical and then also in other ways non-technical. And so my environmental policy major allowed for me to um, really do the work of applying um, sort of like a critical lens into how I use data. And so understanding what is the ethnographic experience that I'm trying to capture with data and like working with data um, as both a quantitative measure, but understanding that, you know, you also need other kinds of information, like thick information as some people will call it, um, to fully explore a question. And I think that um, Barnard really enabled me to do that. And that helps me a lot in my current job because um, I do a lot of test design and tool development. Um, and you need to be able to have a very creative way of thinking to be able to do that kind of work. Um, and so, you know, by going to Barnard and having requirements, you're trained to think like that either way. So I think by just being a student at Barnard, um, you're kind of already at an advantage in that sense. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, I'm Eileen. Can you guys hear me fine through my mask? Okay, cool. I'm right. technically in a private room so should be fine um I don't this is like the only day I ever go into the office um so I'm not usually here um but I graduated in 2019 um I studied environmental science um and I'm currently a software engineer slash devops engineer um, at a company called McMaster in Chicago um which they do like logistics and supply chain stuff um, and I feel like Barnard really gave me like a lot of good learning in the classroom. Like there were a lot of cool classes that I took that taught me like critical thinking and analytical skills and stuff like that. Um, but I think probably like the most impactful place that I learned was like outside doing research, um, that I got connected to through Barnard. Um, and I think like the skills that I learned in the lab and um, through like my experiments and stuff um, really helped transition me into this job, which like I did not study software engineering or computer science or anything like that. Um, and so I'm kind of like brand new here, um, but like I've been able to transfer a lot of like the analytical skills that I already had um, through different experiences at Barnard. Um, to this job and it hasn't been like too bad of a learning curve so yeah that's awesome i want to kind of underscore some of the common points that that the four of you have expressed because i think there there's some recurring themes that have come out this week one is this kind of uh shay i think you said holistic uh education and i think it's this notion of being a stem student at barnard not only trains you in some technical laboratory, you know, the important foundations, Joanne Lee, you said foundations uh, set you up, or the foundations that you learned in the classroom, not the class foundations, but the foundations in lab set you up for success. I think that's what you're saying. Um, but so, but you also got get this exposure to uh, critical thinking structures that are outside STEM disciplines, writing, um, being able to talk science, being able to understand how to work collaboratively on a team. Um, so I think that's one thing that has come up. I want to I want to get to one that I think is maybe more of a cause of anxiety this summer um, when everything is kind of shut down and research opportunities have been suspended uh, and folks are obviously 
you know, internships have been canceled. There's a lot going on. And, and so some of what you all have talked about with respect to research experience and internships setting you up for success. Put, if you could put yourself in the shoes of, of students who are going through this particular summer, what's some advice that you might give about how to continue to build your experience in areas that will set you up for success that maybe are different from the conventional, like an SRI summer um, or an internship alone, like the things they can be doing around networking, around doing technical development skills online. Like if you were in their shoes, um, I know this is kind of an extraordinary summer, but what, what advice might you give um, to help reduce anxiety? Sure, um, I think particularly in the computer science um, digital sphere, what matters more than any actual work experience that you have is being able to present projects that you've created from start to finish. And it doesn't matter what, whether you were led by XYZ person, um, if you've personally made something that is very impressive, that is a great reason for someone to hire you. Um, particularly when it's something that you can speak very intelligently about, that you're passionate about, um, and that is like very specifically like a representative of who you are. Um, and so even though I currently have a job, something that I'm working on this summer as I have more time at home quarantining, um, is making a beautiful website for myself. Um, and it'll just be like sort of my resume, but also it's a great way to like integrate my technical skills into something that I can just add in any job application. Um, and people can see like a representation of different things I've worked on. Um, so just taking on fun projects that personally um, are fun to you and also represent the skills that you've learned at Barnard. Yeah, I think building a personal website, taking some time to do that is definitely something we've advocated uh, this summer for sure and will help no matter what field you're heading into. What else? Um, I feel like my experience in research, like there is definitely some like physical hands on, like I'm putting this chemical in this test tube kind of thing. Um, but I also think like there was so much of my research experience that was just like reading and finding like different journals, different literature reviews. Um, and I feel like, well, I feel like I know that people who are doing research still need that kind of help. Um, and so I feel like something that could be useful now would be to still keep reaching out to professors and still keep reaching out to scientists um, who are doing research that you're interested in and seeing if you can still help virtually because the actual like, at least in my experience, the actual physical work of it was like, you only get to do that once you like fully understand the background and you're fully informed based on like all the like pre-research that you do. Um, and that really is the most important part. So I feel like um, those opportunities could still be out there and would be useful to pursue. Yeah, I agree with Eileen. I remember at Barnard, I earlier on I did um, clinical research and when thinking back, a lot of it was very remote. So I think it is true that there could still be possibilities in which you could reach out to a PI and they could have an opportunity for you to work remotely. Like Eileen said, um, you could start like they, you could start with background information, and I think leading up again, you would have to you there's a lot of you know preparing yourself with the knowledge and that sort of thing. But some labs are kind of exclusively you know data analysis and maybe not so much in the lab. So you could still get that research experience for sure. Yeah, I guess I'll just echo what everyone else has said. You know the you know, most important thing, um, uh, I think Carson mentioned this, is just like actual experience. That's what's very, very important with STEM, any kind of like technical role. Um, they wanna see that you've um, thought of something, developed an idea, and that you've done it, um, and that it works. Um, and in the midst of that, that you've uh, used, you know, uh, skills, and so, you know, programming languages to be able to do that. Um, and so if you can commit yourself, even if it's like a very small project, 
to building something um, that you're, you know, remotely interested in, um, that should definitely get your foot in the door. Um, I'll also echo, I think this is a really great time um, for self-reflection and for creating your personal brand. Um, and a website definitely helps with that. Um, you know, so your website could be your portfolio, you can link it to your GitHub. Um, and in building a website, um, you know, the front end development, there's a lot to be learned there as well. And so, you know, as for me, you know, that's what I've been focusing on as well, like building my own website. Um, and so I definitely just like echo the idea of uh, focusing on a project. I would say if you maybe don't have a relationship with the PI, I think for me at while I was um, in undergrad, I really didn't have those connections until later on in my college career. And so that is the situation that you're in. Um, find a project that you're interested in. My little sister is a computer science major herself, and she is working on a summer project with her friends just for fun. Um, but that's definitely something that she's going to put on her resume. Um, I'll also echo that it would be nice to work on a, proje a project with other people as well, um, because you can teach um, and then you can also learn. Um, and it takes off the, pro the sort of like the pressure and it allows some, for some accountability. Um, so it's just not going to be as slow or as daunting when you do it with other people. So, um, yeah, pretty much just like echoing what everyone else said. I think that's such a great point is like building this notion. I think one of the things that we hear in advising a lot right now is people just feel alone, you know, like you just feel like you're alone in your apartment and maybe with your family for the first time in a couple of years and it feels weird and building a community around yourself and being accountable to other people, but also creating something with that group. Is just, I think that's terrific advice about how to uh, make use of the time. I appreciate um, some of what you are all saying, which is using this language of contribution. So I think there's a, there's a sense of something has been taken away by this summer. Um, how can I get it back? And one of the best things that I've seen students do is to reach out to PIs and say, actually, I know you're hurting right now. Your research is suffering. How can I contribute a literature review? What do you need remotely that I can actually do for you? What can I bring to the table? And that sets up a relationship for later. You know, you're the person who reached out during a remote time so that when we're actually back all together in person, whenever that is, conducting research, you're the kind of person who occurs to that PI as, as having reached out during this period. Um, Shay, if I, could, if I could stay with you for a second, and maybe I know in our kind of email exchanges beforehand, you talked about maybe being open to just discussing your process of discerning graduate school directions Graduate school is on a lot of people's minds um, in STEM fields. I could tell that this week. Um, so I'd love to hear any of your perspectives about how you decided to apply and the process of applying. And then if any of you all are at some point thinking about graduate pursuits, like how do you fit those into your career trajectory ambitions? Cool, sure. Um, so I am an incoming PhD student at UC Berkeley in their School of Information. Um, I, you know, have been pursuing um, graduate school for a while. Uh, both Alan and I <laughs> have, you know, done that research thing um, in the environmental science department. And so we've crossed paths a lot as a lot of people have pursued that over the years. Um, I, you know, my journey <laughs> has been incredibly long. Um, I was an MMUF fellow uh, while I was at Barnard. Um, I'm not sure if you all are aware of uh, the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship, but it is a fellowship that supports uh, minority students who want to pursue um, graduate school and eventually tenureship. Um, and it's a really great opportunity um, in that uh, first and foremost, you get funding, you get money um, to pursue ideas that you care about. Um, and then you also get mentorship um, to understand the very, very complex pathway to getting a PhD, um, being successful at it, and then um, deciding to pursue tenure, which is like a whole nother beast. Um, but, you know, as for me, you know, because I was an, uh, a Mellon Mays Fellow in undergrad, like starting my sophomore year, it's been something that I've been working at for a few years now. Um, but uh, I would say my decision making process for that was in that I kind of realized, hey, I really love research questions. Um, I've got a ton of them. Um, and I, I find the most growth and the most um, like intrigue in asking these questions and crafting these questions. And so I think if you're the kind of student that really gets a lot from learning and discovering, and <clears throat> a lot of academics will say this, knowledge production, 
um, loves the engagement of knowledge production and finding gaps of where, let's say, um, a paper is missing some kind of extrapolation. I definitely say that, like, uh, not only graduate school, but the PhD would be for you um, because the PhD is a professional research degree. Uh, you're going to school to write a book on something that has never been written before. Um, and so, you know, if that is the kind of orientation that you have towards school, um, then um, the PhD would be for you. If that is not the orientation that you have towards school, then the PhD is definitely not for you. Um, or more often than not, it's not um, because it is a long term uh, graduate degree. My program is six years. Um, and so, you know, that's when I would say, okay, maybe consider a master's if the master's is a means towards reaching a specific kind of end. Um, that'll help you in industry or um, in the nonprofit sector, or if you really just like to enable or uplift other people's research. Um, and so, you know, in regards to just kind of like the directions one would go in, I would say, you know, asking yourself, do I really like asking questions? Um, do I only get even more and more interested as more and more questions arise? Um, do I find myself not too frustrated by having to learn new things? Um, and constantly having to be flexible with stretching um, my intellectual, like, you know, imagination. If that's the case, then I think graduate school is definitely for you. Um, I'd also, a lot of people, I hope say this, but I, I really am an advocate of taking a break um, from your undergraduate, after having graduated from your undergraduate degree before going to grad school. It would have been two years for me, which I think is a, a very good amount of time to like take a break for. Um, but, you know, I decided to, around the latter half of like my Barnard years, I was like, yeah, I really like this data science, data analytics thing. Um, I may not want to go to grad school. And so I decided to get a job in analytics um, and I really, really loved it. Um, but then I was like, yeah, I still have these questions that I care so much about and I can't do it at work. Um, and so for me, that was like confirmation that, um, that yeah, I should like definitely move on and go to graduate school. I have a lot of friends that, you know, I was an undergrad with that also had this plan of getting a PhD and then they decided not to because they realized that they wanted to pursue other things um, and that they could get to their goals without a PhD um, because it is, a, it is an investment. Um, you know, you're not making that much money, although most programs um, are fully funded. So I'll go to school and they'll pay me, but, um, you kind of like take a loss in other areas, which would mean developing an industry. And so if your goal is to get a PhD to make more money, it's definitely not <laughs> the way you should be thinking about it. Um, you could definitely do that with the master's. Within STEM, you could definitely also maybe not even have to go to grad school for that. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, that's pretty much like my experience. That's, yeah, I mean, that's that's been, I wish that you had been here Wednesday to give my presentation, or Tuesday to give my presentation on graduate school instead of me. I was so nervous while you were talking. I was like, oh God, I hope I didn't contradict any of that because that sounds correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm wondering, do, do other of you all have, have um, uh, things to add? I mean, Joanne Lee, I, I feel like when we last talked, you were thinking about a PhD and uh, Eileen and Carson, I'm not sure if, it, I, don't, I don't think this has come up in our conversations necessarily, but I'd, I'd be curious to hear about different degrees or different perspectives about doctoral work in STEM as well. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think that, um, like Shay said, the, like I'm taking some gap time right now and getting ready to apply to medical school. So, you know, when I was leaving Barnard, I was left with, okay, engaged in different kinds of research. I like medicine, but I like research. I don't know which one I like more. Like, am I interested in just one degree, a dual degree? Like, I just had a lot of questions. So I knew that, like, towards the end of my Barnard career, I knew that, okay, what I do in this gap time, I want to kind of refine my interests. And so I knew that I really liked the bench scientific work rather than um, kind of, like, more, like, data analytics. So I applied for most of my jobs were mostly, like, bench research, and I landed a job in bench research. And I've really enjoyed it. I've met a lot of different kinds of collaborators that have a dual degree, just a PhD, an MD, different degrees. So I think that for me made me realize that I could still engage in parts of research without a particular degree that I could feel confining later. So for example, some people in, in my lab have an MD-PhD, 
and later on in their career decided, okay, I just want to do research. I'm not interested that much in patient care, at least directly. My lab studies um, the connection between immunology and stroke pathology. So I could see for that person that they really like medical science, but rather, like, like um, Shay said, more like knowledge production side of it. And for me, I think that in my gap time, I've realized that I like research, but I'm more interested in the patient care and application of science while still wanting to do that to some degree later. So I think, so right now I'm preparing to apply to a medical program, but while still knowing that I want to engage in research and being in this lab and in the field that I'm in it has allowed me to see that, yeah, it's still possible to engage in research to a, a great depth without having to do the PhD or a dual degree. That's great. I think you're echoing both of you are saying about, you know, I think we think about, I like to say there's no such thing as a gap year in your life. It's just your life, right? You're not like jumping off a cliff for a year. But I, what I love is that both of you have filled this time with real kind of intensive reflection, very kind of directed questions about how to think about yourself in relationship to your STEM work, what you want to get out of it, what you might be thinking about in specific graduate programs. And I think that's that self-reflective work is so important during a time when you're not engaged in, in uh, kind of school. Um, but Carson, Eileen, do you want to add to this? Should we, we can move on as well. I mean, up to you. Um, I can add a little bit just for like the MBA perspective. Sure. Um, I'm definitely someone who would not be great doing a PhD for the exact reasons that she said. Um, so I, right now I'm in a like consideration period about getting an MBA. Um, obviously things have changed since COVID. I was definitely set to like want to begin, you know, taking courses for tests and like start applying the summer. Um, and now I'm reconsidering. Um, in my industry, I've looked at all of these like executive directors at Chanel and IT and like I worked at IBM and like the director of the account I was on, um, all of these women have MBAs. And so that has always been a huge goal for me. Um, but now I've been thinking about it and the fact that they got those 30, 40 years ago. Um, and many people in tech and in startups now that I respect don't have that huge educational background. Um, and so I think it's really, it really depends on which direction you want to go to. Is it um, a more, you know, corporate role that you want to level up on? Or is it a more entrepreneurial path that you want to take? Um, and so currently, like I'm personally, I'm under a lot of like reflection about um, which path I want to take. Um, I would say the same thing as Carson. Like I think like maybe even more now because of coronavirus and everything that's going on, like I've had more time to kind of sit with myself and think about what I actually want to do. And so I've mostly been keeping busy like studying for the GRE because I know that that will be useful no matter what I decide to apply to. Um, but I've definitely also been considering MBA. Um, I'm interested in like technical product management. Um, and I know that that's a very like common way to get there, not the only way to get there. Um, but I'm also interested in some more technical masters like computer science or data science. Um, and I'd also agree that like, yeah, I figured out that PhD wasn't for me um, kind of late in the game, like a little later into my senior year than I would have wanted. Um, but um, I think that like, I would agree with what Shay said, which is that like, if it doesn't feel completely right for you to commit yourself to that kind of research and like that kind of time commitment, um, I would totally recommend like taking a breather and maybe trying to get some other sort of experience to, or like a job or taking some other kind of break um, before committing to that because it is a really, really serious almost, I wouldn't say like a life commitment, um, but like five to seven years is not a trivial amount of time. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I would echo that. 
So I, I'm wondering then this time if I can stay with you, Eileen, because I, I remember our conversations about McMaster and, you know, when you were starting to think about options in front of you, this wasn't an option that like you divined, right? It didn't like drop into your lap. But, but as all of you were talking about the virtues of taking some time, I'm just curious about what advice you might offer about the discernment process of, you know, just even understand we get questions constantly, like, I don't even know what's out there. And that's a totally natural question to have. So I'm just curious about, you know, your process of, of exploring options and, you know, what you can tell students about how do you figure out what a product, product manager is? How do you figure out what, um, you know, a clinical research assistant does? Uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're in STEM, do you have any idea of like advertising analytics? Maybe that doesn't occur to people. So like, what was the process of understanding what the landscape looks like for you? Um, I really honestly just talked to a bunch of people and like some of them were people that I knew directly like um, my PIs were really helpful. Um, I remember I talked to Shay one summer actually and she tried to help me um, like figure out some sort of GIS analytics roles that I was interested in. Um, but then also like I found it super easy to reach out to Barnard alums, like very, very easy. And now that I am one, like that makes a lot of sense because literally if anybody like cold messaged me, like I would try to help. Um, honestly, Barnard or not, like, yeah, it just, it, it's not really, you know, it, it's not difficult, no skin off my back. Um, and a lot of like random Googling, like I spent like hours looking at different kinds of jobs because after I figured out that I didn't want to do a PhD like I'd been doing research every summer all through the year like taking like classes oriented towards the kind of PhD that I wanted to do and so once I figured out that I didn't actually want to do it anymore I definitely felt like super lost um, and had no idea what was out there and so I think like don't be afraid to like reach out to anybody but especially like don't underestimate like your peers as well and the connections that they might have like which is what I found with Shay is like oh like she knows all these people that are doing stuff that I'm interested in and like maybe it would be a little nerve-wracking to reach out to those people directly but it's easy to re reach out to her because like I've seen her around like she feels more on like my level and like a yeah like a like a true peer so I always say the most underutilized resource of Barnard's by Barnard students is other Barnard students um you know Barnard students who are two years older than you who don't need that internship anymore because they're going on to full-time work, take that internship directly from that Barnard student, like um, reach out and contact them. It's, it tends to be pretty easy. Um, I want to uh, just be, have some fidelity to questions that start to come in. So if you, I, I'm very interested to hear all of your responses because I'm sure they'll be interesting. And if you want to say anything in passing, um, maybe share Carson, especially like for someone who doesn't come from a data science or computer science background, you know, how do you recommend when you're discerning these many roles out there, how you get the foot in the your foot in the door for those kinds of positions, data analysts or data intensive. Um, so if you want to weave that into, you know, your own process of discerning options in front of you, that'd be awesome. Sure. Um, so I definitely am someone who relied a lot on connections to get different roles and um, in my first like big college internship, um, I worked really hard and I was really useful and I was kind of like poached by different managers who I connected with and like became my mentors. Um, and from there, I started to learn more about these different roles, like being a digital product manager. It's kind of a weird and new type of role and like in this era um, because it's so like technical and creative. Um, but I think for, for people who don't have a huge computer science background and want to break more into, well, specifically data analyst positions um, in, I can speak to like e-commerce data analyst positions, M many people in like the retail e-commerce space who are data analysts did not necessarily study that. Um, for instance, I work a lot with analytics um, because I have to measure like the key performance indicators of our website. Um, and so I'm constantly 
making note of kind of all of the the jargon and like the terms that we use to define these um, these metrics of success for the business. Um, and so I've had to work really hard on how to refine these reports that I do and these graphs. And I've worked with a lot of consultants who've come to our business and um, started churning out these analytics on the business that they've refined these like programs over years um, of how to um, determine whether a business is successful or not. And every time that we work with them, I'm constantly taking screenshots in their presentations. Um, I am constantly like writing down what those terms are. So even if you're in a internship or you're just like shadowing someone um, that isn't like in any, like a marketing role or any role, there's always gonna be some data aspect right now. And so just taking note of that and even um, learning those terms that you can use in interviews to show that you've been learning and ingesting and you know what they're talking about when they refer to like conversion rates or you know average order value. Um, that's a great way to, to succeed at least in an interview there. Um, can I chime in really quickly? Um, so, yeah, I feel like this is a, uh, that was a really great question. Um, so my background is in environmental policy. It's not necessarily the, it's not explicitly the most, you wouldn't necessarily think of STEM when you think about environmental policy. And so I made it a point to like pursue environmental data analysis. Um, but I will say that, you know, I haven't always been a data analyst. Um, I work in ad tech. So the same things that Carson was talking about, like KPIs and like CPC and like um, click to convert, things of that nature. Um, something that I learned for sure on the job and did require um, uh, a lot of like homework, you know, after work um, for the first couple of months. So I'll definitely say that that's not necessarily like an expectation that they'd have for you when applying. So those are good words to use to show that you've studied up. But they're not looking for that. And I've interviewed people um, for like uh, roles like this, but I will say that like, for me, I actually was a product specialist. That was my first job out of college. It wasn't something that I was looking for. I kind of just fell into it because I was like, I really want a job <laughs> and really wanted to get it over with and was like super insecure about landing something that, um, that I would like. So I just like jumped on the first one that I could get, which is not a good thing to do. So I would not suggest that. Believe in yourself more and your abilities. Um, but in that vein, you know, I, I say that to say that like, you can give yourself time. Um, you can work towards and take time towards being able to pursue those kinds of roles. When COVID wasn't happening, I went to free general assembly uh, uh, meetups. And then I was also part of like the meetup um, app and went to talks on how the New York Times uses their data. So I'm really into like data visualization. And so, you know, I met people in the city and like started having conversations with them while I was still in this like product specialist, product support kind of role at my job. And internally within the company that I worked at, I actually switched into a data analyst role and also got promoted within like six months. Um, so I like filled in that gap um, that I was having an issue with about not being able to initially get into that job post-grad. So I would say like give yourself grace, definitely pursue those kinds of role roles, but let's say if you don't get one, because I did apply for a lot of data science, data analytics jobs originally after undergrad, um, you know, you can wait and you can see other avenues for being able to get there. So like oftentimes what people will do is they'll start off as like a consultant or they'll start off as like a product manager or something like that. Or if they want to move into data analytics, they'll just do an internal switch, which means that interviewing for it is a whole lot easier. It's kind of just for like technicalities. Um, and then it just gives you more room to learn how to, uh, you know, basically just do the job. Um, so I'd say that that's like an unconventional way that I took, but also very possible. So let's say if you can't be a data analyst now, you still definitely can be in the very near future. I did it under a year after graduating from school. This is um, getting 
That's the get, get everybody on the train first and then figure out where they sit once they're aboard. Hire a good person, get them into the firm, and then figure exactly. out how to move around. And Eileen, I think your position is kind of meant for that, isn't it? If I remember, if it's like a rotational program where you, you kind of move around. Yeah, so my position, well, my um, company in general, like, hires a lot of, like, I guess you would call it like a science to engineering program. So they hire a lot of STEM grads um, who don't like explicitly have data science or computer science backgrounds. Um, and um, like put us through like, not a super formal rotational program, but like you kind of move around to different teams. Um, and our tech department isn't huge, but it's pretty big. We have like 250 people. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff going on like back end, front end, like app development, web development, um, like anything you can really imagine. Um, and so, yeah, like we, it, I would agree um, that like, it's a lot easier to like switch on the inside sometimes. Like when I first started here, like I thought, oh, like I'm gonna be making a website or like something like super stereotypical. Um, and I ended up kind of like more in an infrastructure DevOps role, um, which is more like dealing with servers and like building like data infrastructure and like whatever. Um, but like, it's been pretty easy to like indicate what I wanna do and like what teams that I would be interested in switching to um, now that I'm already here. Um, so yeah, I would say, I would say the same thing. That's great. I, I do wanna get to Hannah's question. Joanne Lee, this was already on my mind. I know that, uh, just let me kind of set it up a little bit more too. So we hear all the time, STEM majors especially, you know, everybody's friend gets a job in the fall and it's like, I'm the only person without a job left by April. And I, I, I just know from my experience that, you know, these cell, these kind of uh, lab positions can tend to open late, uh, very late in the cycle, March, April, May, even June. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk exactly about what uh, your experience uh, applying for these positions about timeline about you know when you started looking and when things started to convert to interviews and actual positions it's a it's a perennial concern for science students that come to seek advising yeah so i actually got my current position through an alum so definitely use your alum resources um and kind of going with that this like the, the job was first mentioned to me by a professor so I think definitely while you're looking for a job, don't be afraid to ask professors that you're close to or that are that are in touch with alumni that could be that could be aware of opportunities. Um, and I definitely agree with AJ. Some of these opportunities open up a lot later because usually, at least people in my position, they are in an intermediate time where like they're applying to grad school and such. And usually, like this is the time you hear back. And then if they decide, okay, I'm going to this program. It, it happens very quickly that they decide um, I'm, I'm moving on and this position has to be filled. So I definitely think that, you know, you, you don't be afraid of if, you know, if it's like April or May or even later that you don't have a, a job yet in, the, in this particular field because I was definitely in that position. Um, and yeah, so I, I first spoke with the professor um, and kind of he kind of gave me some background about the job and like about the student. I got in contact with the student she was so nice, very open to questions, and I got a, little, a lot of information through her. And the the gap between emailing and then interviewing, um, sometimes it can take a long time, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're out of the like out of the loop. Um, for me, it happened kind of quickly, but another alum that was hired at the same time as me, like she also waited a long time, but still managed to get the job. So I don't think that that's a sign of like, oh, they definitely are not interested and like I should move on. Um, and something that I want to highlight, um, kind of go back to something Shay said earlier. Um, I, I, I was almost upon graduation and did not have a job. And so that made me feel like I should grab the first thing that came my way. And while I was accepting and looking at this job, another job did come my way. And so I did have to do I did have to make a decision. And I think that's something that helped me discern because the jobs were very similar since I was since I was looking at research technician jobs. Something that helped me kind of decipher one job over the other is look for jobs that, you know, will give you the chance to grow. Sure, you do bring a lot to the table, but you want to be able to not only contribute what you have, but expand. And that is what I saw in 
my particular job now that I saw was kind of lacking in the other job opportunity that I had. So I definitely think that is important that you want to come into a job knowing, okay, like I can bring these certain skills. I know I can be good at the skills that I have and contribute them, but I also want there to be space to grow and space for you to learn because a job is more than, you know, the paycheck and whatnot. It's definitely an opportunity for you to grow and figure out what exactly you want to do with this experience and what you want to do in the future. Um, yeah. That's great. And I, I kind of want to, um, so first of all, I mean, all of this, the stuff that you're saying about timeline is, is so important, I think, to convey and underline, you know, it can be later. You might start, a person from the same, in the same lab might have started in January, and that's when the position is first posted and funding is confirmed, but the PI doesn't get around to actually hiring until two months later, just because HR is not like at the top of list, the list of things that happens at some of these research institutions. Um, so I think all of that is, is really important. Um, I kind of I kind of want to turn to actually to Carson for this this question from Shireen to, to kind of argue against yourself. Um, you know, Shireen asks, uh, she wants to study neuroscience. She's interested in entrepreneurship, but feels pressured to study computer science and AI. Um, both subjects can be very course heavy. Any advice on combating the internal pr pressure to do at CS? So maybe argue against yourself at 20 years old and say, you know, you don't need that CS major after all. Um, do this instead, or what, what basics do you need? And then maybe like advocate for the CS major too, of course. If Rebecca sure. Wright, the chair of CS, heard me say this, I'm afraid about my job. <laughs> <laughs> um, I totally feel this um, so much. I was 100% there, except I was interested in French and art history. Um, and, you know, the C CS is incredibly tough at Barnard and Columbia. It was like, there are so many times when I was like totally reconsidering my path and like just wanted to quit everything. Um, what I have to say is that everyone has their own path to success and very few people have a very conventional path to success. And when you're taking these classes in computer science and in STEM overall, where so much of how you're defined, like success is defined in those classes is based on your grades, which are then competitive with other people in the classes because they set the the like average of the tests to like 30 percent and then it's on a curve and so um you feel sometimes like you're not good enough if you get a b in the class because you're used to getting a's in all your other classes or whatever and um it's really stressful and i've been there um what i would say is don't let the grades stress you out and know, know that you're in these classes to learn skills. Um, I would have benefited so much from knowing that at Barnard um, because I spent a lot of time worrying over the little things instead of taking a step back and saying, oh my gosh, I just made a server like in advanced programming. That's amazing. Um, and so, that that will help reduce some stress for you. Otherwise, it's very, very helpful to at least have a couple computer science classes on your resume instead of having the whole degree if you don't have time to do that. Um, what I do is I have like a relevant coursework section um, on my resume where I'm like, I learned C++ in this class. I learned JavaScript in this class. I, I learned Python in this class. Um, and be careful about what computer science classes you choose, um, depending on what career route you want to take, if you're only going to, if you're not going to do the full degree, because there are some that are really going to be beneficial to your career path and learning. Um, for instance, I regret not taking databases. Yep. That's something and that, that, that comes would up be consistent. very helpful. Yeah. Database um, structures are two of the courses, right, that, that are, are extremely valuable. Yeah, and definitely save your notes from data structures. 
is another suggestion. Um, I like wrote all of my notes out very clearly in a notebook. Those are very helpful for um, interviews and just to have that knowledge because it'll help you down the line. So, you know, if you don't want to do the full career computer science degree, it's fine, but just take what you think will be helpful and, you know, everyone has their own path. I'd love to have Shay and Eileen weigh in on this too, because I think at several points you've kind of said, you know, you found yourself in a technical, in a, in a more technical role than maybe you, you thought. Um, I don't want to mischaracterize arguments, but, you know, if you have anything to add on this point, I think it's valuable. Yeah, I guess I would just say, like, if you figure out something that you want to do, like, it's really never too late, which is something that I struggled with. Like, I kind of realized that I was interested in development and software engineering, like, very late in the game. Um, and I ended up getting this job that, like, catered to that. But this was definitely not the only job out there that's willing to train people who literally, like, don't know anything. Um, maybe that's like too mean to myself to say like I do know some things but like um it's not like I would say even you know obviously you are you're still in school right now but like I would say even after like if you figure out something that you want to do like there definitely is a way to get there and like if you can solidify that in college that's great and like take courses that are relevant like obviously like that will give you a head start but you definitely don't need it to like be successful and do something that you're interested in. So I want to be mindful of your time. Oh, Shay, did you want to add there? Sorry, I didn't see you come off mute. Uh, yeah, I really have nothing to add. You said it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's stay with you for our kind of like wrap up lightning round. I asked this question in so many alumni panels across the, the entire year. Um, if you can think back to yourself uh, in, in, at Barnard, what is the one piece of advice that you can offer now that you wish that you were able to offer yourself uh, when you were still a student? Um, that's a great question. Um, honestly, like I would give myself more grace. <laughs> um, like you're in college from like 18 to like 21, 22, like it's just such a young age to know what you wanna do with your life. Um, and you're expected to really have no idea and to even graduate having no idea. Um, you know, so I think I would have, I just I was like y'all, you know, just on these calls, going to these things, networking. And by the time I graduated, I was just super tired um, and had to do a lot of um, self-care, like immediately post-graduation. Um, and I just kind of like didn't do a lot of fun college things because I was so nervous. You know, I'm a first gen college student. So there's a lot of there was a lot of pressure to like make school worth it. Um, so I would just say like, you know, you're you're doing it. You're doing great. The fact that you're on this Zoom call is amazing. And life is full of second chances and changing and evolving. And I would say embrace that. Don't stifle it. Um, so, yeah, take it easy. That'd be my advice. Um, I would say, um, just what I said before, which is everyone has their own path to success. Um, I, just echoing when I was at Barnard, I did not even know there was a role that existed that fit my interests. Um, and I was, I'm really happy that I took the time to just follow my passions and take this huge breadth of courses. Um, so just absorb as much as you can in the areas that you're interested in and take those classes that you love and you're gonna learn a lot from and love to learn from. And you'll find something that is perfect for you. Um, I would say, like, if you ever have, like, any questions, like, about what you're doing or where you're headed, like, please just, like, reach out to people. I feel like I didn't start really, like, aggressively reaching out to people until a lot later in my college career, and, like, 
people like AJ were super helpful to me, but I literally only met him my senior year. And like, I, everything turned out fine. Like I'm happy. No, with- don't tell them that part. Start early. <laughs> yeah. But like, but I would say like, even just in terms of stress management, like I definitely came in with the mindset, like, oh, like I can figure this out on my own. Like who knows myself better than me, which to some degree, like is true. But at the same time, like people can help and like, it's okay to not fully know what you're doing and ask like a hundred people what they're doing and see if that is interesting to you. And like, you can change your mind, like whenever. Yeah. Just to echo kind of what everyone else has said. Um, my advice would be to not be afraid of not liking the, the plan you thought you would go with. I think it's sometimes it can be easy to just like go with the, just go with the flow. Like here at Barnard, people are doing this. Like everyone seems to be doing something. And I think it's, it's definitely okay to, you know, step back and say like, Oh, I had this plan and I actually don't like it. And I, I don't, maybe I don't know what the next step is, but like, this is the time for me to figure it out. Like it, it's okay to embrace change. And in fact, I think that many people should. Joanne Lee, I'm gonna let you have the last word there. Um, I just wanna say thank you you for, this was such a lovely discussion. It's always my favorite day of the week when we get to sit down and uh, virtually talk to uh, alums from such different places in your life and different places in your career and your reflection. It's always extremely helpful. So I wanna say thank you. Um, again, um, be safe and stay well to the four of you and to everybody on the call tomorrow, we're going to have a faculty panel uh, to round out STEM week and think back about things that we've discussed about career paths, about graduate school, about your ambitions, and we'll chart some uh, different paths from there. Um, but in the meantime, thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody again. We will definitely be in touch. Take the advice of the alumni in front of you right now and make sure that you reach out, connect, ask for help, build your community of support. Uh, Even when we're virtual and fragmented and alone with our families and pets, the Barnard community is still here to, uh, to support. So bye everybody. Thank you so much again.